Um, so we're going to talk about, uh, this is a little bit different than people have thought about previously. Um, does the uterine secretome, I don't know how to pronounce, what the, where the emphasis should be on that word, but um, does it play a role in the initiation of ovarian cancer? Um, I'm at Baylor. I'm going to figure out which button to push. That's it. Uh, my disclaimer, um, some of this work was done when I was in the Army, um, so um, it's not the official policy of the Army. Um, it was not a part of my official duties, um, and the government has no say or, or opinion about what we're going to discuss. The, the animals were cared for, uh, following the guide of care of animals, and I have no financial uh, disclosures. All right, so there's a picture on the left. Uh, I've been sent the gear to wear for Overcome. Uh, this is actually, we have a house in Woodville, Washington. They, I was told to share a fun fact. So there on the right, you see myself and my brother um, making the stairs that I'm sitting on uh, a year ago. That, those are planks. Um, it's a tree that had grown in the front of the yard. Um, but you see it there on the right on the ground. Um, it's pretty close to the house, so basically that was me up in the tree putting a cable on the other tree you know, so that we could pull it so it wouldn't fall on the house. And you see the second tree in the back there, and that's the corner of the gutter. It came pretty close as far as that. There's a, ro it, there's a little bit of twist down at the bottom of the tree, so it kind of rotated and twisted a little bit and fell. It's not quite where I wanted it to, but anyway, so there's my fun fact for the day. Moving on to the topic of discussion. Um, I told, I said, okay, here, let's talk about ovarian cancer. And lo and behold, um, shortly after I said, this is what I was going to talk about, uh, this little blurb came out on the net, on the internet, two sides of endosalpingiosis. Is that a benign growth or a harbinger of cancer? So, what? Okay. Um, and lo and behold, SGO, as Dr. Lucci said, is a group of G1 oncologists. They sent out a little blurb about Endosalpingiosis doubled the likelihood of a concurrent gynecologic malignancy. Well, what do we do with that? If a patient comes back on their path report and says they have endosalpingiosis, how do you counsel them? Well, as it turns out, and again, here's the paper that just came out, the association of endosalpingiosis with gynecologic malignancy. That sounds kind of scary, right? Um, as six years prior, and this is a, a picture of the headline from when it came out, uh, or the article rather, you know, endosalpingiosis is more than just an incidental finding at the time of gynecologic surgery. And when the article was in press, that came out. So it was like, at that point, it was like, what do we do with that? What is endosalpingiosis? It's that lining of the tube um, when it grows where it doesn't belong. And there's another condition, endometriosis, people are more familiar with that. And that's when the lining of the uterus grows where it does not belong. And women have that, they have pain, um, and that's kind of a more known condition. We kind of know what to expect. Um, endosalpingiosis had been reported, but nobody really paid attention to it. And so it was like, okay, now again, what do we do with that? There's a couple of pictures up there. At the bottom, the, the endosalpingiosis on the left is a little bit more of a cystic lesion. The endometriosis resembles the lining of the uterus and grows glands. So coming back to that paper that was first discussed from half a dozen years ago, 60,000 path reports from several hospitals in New England, about one and a half percent of the cases had, can had um, endosalpingiosis. Well, if you looked at cancer patients, 42% of them had it, right? And so the question, the lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is one and a half percent, and we now think that it may come from the tube, and endosalpingiosis comes from the tube, and so you put two and two together, right? Is, is it a precursor? Again, what do you do with that? And then brand new paper came out, endosalpingiosis is associated with cancer more than endometriosis. It's a case control study. Is it a concern? What do you do with that? So um, when that first paper came out, we were wondering, well, what do we do with that? I think the question is answered, or at least partially answered, from this paper in 2020 that we published from um, our data um, that we collected uh, following that paper, the prevalence of endosalpingiosis. As it turns out, endosalpingiosis, it increases with age and persists after menopause, whereas endometriosis decreases, okay? And so just keep that in mind. But if you look at it, and you look carefully, and we use this uh, uh, CFIM protocol where you look carefully at all the tubes, 
and ovaries and, you know, to identify all the possible lesions. And that wasn't kind of the standard you know, prior to this, and it isn't now either, right? The, we specifically did this because we were concerned. Did we need to let patients know or not? As it turns out, women between 31 and 50, they had their ovaries out, and the ovaries were a common site where it happened, so you had to evaluate that specific group. Well, uh, over a third of women had it. One out of three women had endosalpingiosis, right? And so if you go back and say ovarian cancer is one in 70, then it's much less likely to be a precursor lesion, which is what you might have presumed based on that other paper. Um, if you counted paratubal cysts, you know, they're on a stalk coming off of the fallopian tube. Over half of the women had it. And again, over the age of 50, you know, about two-thirds of women had endosalpingiosis. So it's a super common condition. <clears throat> if you look at cancer cases in postmenopausal women, the number is even greater. You know, three-quarters of those patients had it when you looked carefully at the, the tubes. And basically what happened was we looked over the course of a year after that initial paper had ca came out, and that's kind of where our data came from in over 500 specimens. And so um, I think it's a fair estimate of the true prevalence. And if anything, it might be underestimated because if you look more and you look more closely, you'll find even more of it if you did additional cuts through your tissue kind of thing. So, all right. Just a quick thing, ovarian inclusion cysts basically are similar. Um, they look like fallopian tube tissue. It's just confined or, you know, little cystic structures within the ovary. You, you find that together with the uh, endosalpingiosis in about half the time prior to menopause and even more, 80% after menopause. If you look at all the women after menopause, 93% of them have some type of benign ectopic tissue growing where it doesn't belong. So it's just a super common thing in women. Now the thing is you can say women after menopause, who is it that has surgery? Cancer patients, right? And so one of the things we look more closely at those patients as far as what, as far as their pathology. So that's a part of the reason too in that, you know, potentially sampling and who you sample makes a big difference. Um, but again, half of women after menopause, you know, even without cancer, you know, did have endosalpingiosis. So one interest, other interesting finding that we had was if you looked at endosalpingiosis of the fallopian tube, if you, look, if you had it done for sterilization, you didn't have any other GYN condition, and this is in women 31 to 50 because it increased with age, about 10% of women had it if they just had sterilization and didn't need some other procedure. A quarter of the time if, was the prevalence if you had some other condition, if you had fibroids, if you had endometriosis, if you had other stuff. And so, again, and that was significantly different. And so the point there is that if you're growing endosalpingiosis, it's likely that you're growing other stuff too, potentially. And, and again, that why does this stuff grow where it doesn't belong? And that's kind of that sentence at the bottom there. Is it a precursor to cancer or more likely? Does a similar process lead to benign and malignant ectopic lesions? All right, so just a little bit more history, uh, changing gears just a hair. As far as some of the theories of ovarian cancer, there's the tubal hypothesis, is kind of one of the newer ones. Uh, peak in 2004, they had a bunch of patients with fallopian tube or had high risk of ovarian cancer and had surgeries you know, to reduce risk. And lo and behold, they had more commonly you know, precursor lesions in the tubes and cancer in the tubes. And so they said, hey, well, maybe this is where it's coming from. And you see there a picture of the uh, fallopian tube uh, epithelium. There's a couple other theories, and there's some controversy about this, and that's kind of what the discussion was about. Metaplasia is where the cells just, they are one thing and turn into something different, right? And if you think, well, our bodies, we start off as one cell and turn into a whole bunch of different tissues. And so I guess conceptually that makes sense. Uh, one of the authors from 2017, they talked about these ovarian inclusion cysts that are, are look like fallopian tube epithelium and compared it to cysts that resemble ovarian epithelium. And over time, they got more and more of the ones that look like the fallopian tube. And so um, basically they said, well, we think that that supports metaplasia, that the cells just change into other cells. And this is a line from their uh, paper about seven pages in that says, we speculate that the proportion of Pax8 cells, you know, endosalpingeal cells, would decrease or remain unchanged from pre to post menopause when ovulation ceases. So that's the basic underlying assumption that they have, right? 
but that paper from 2020 that I just showed you said that it doesn't decrease, right? So their basic underlying assumption is wrong. And, 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 and their conclusion then, again, their findings contradict this, they said. But again, our findings contradict what they, right? And so the point is that there is some controversy. And then Silva just now, 2022, there's a paper out on metaplasia saying metaplasia is the thing. And lo and behold, if you look what he cites, you know, this cell's metaplasia, it's derived from metaplastic changes according to what Park says, right? And so and there's yet another theory that there's just cells in the peritoneum that are stem cells that over time just decide to change into these other cells. So anyways, moving on. So this is actually what uh, we're working on in the lab. Um, this first paper, again, starting off, you know, just a quick look back, the prevalence was one and a half percent. It's often endosalpingiosis, was often found with endometriosis and as well as uh, gynecologic malignancy. And lo and behold, in their paper, they also found that 75% or so of cancers also had endosalpingiosis. I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time on this slide. And in talking with the residents and medical students, these are things that we talk about, right? You know, that endometriosis and endosalpingiosis have both been associated with gynecologic cancers. Now, there is something that we know, and we know for decades, that tubal ligation, as well as hysterectomy, decreases the risk of ovarian cancer, right? So I asked that question. So why is that? This is exactly what happens, right? And they sit and they think, and hmm, why is that, right? We have no answer, or at least that I've seen. I don't know if any of our, my colleagues have seen any other answers to this, but I've not seen any answers. <clears throat> Another thought to think about, hysterectomy with and without taking the ovaries out, decreases your risk of, uh, of ovarian and breast cancer risk, right? Why does it affect breast cancer risk? It didn't change your brain and your thyroid cancer risk. And the point of throwing that data information out there is just that somehow the uterus not being there is changing things in the body that changes the cancer risk. And we've always thought, at least when I, in my entire career, it's like, well, the uterus is there to support pregnancy. And when you, you're done being pregnant and you don't need your uterus anymore, it doesn't do anything else. But based on this, maybe it does. Um, all right, <clears throat> changing gears just a little bit again, mullerian agenesis, that's a condition where women don't form their uterus they still have their ovaries. They have a the, the tiny bit of the fallopian tube, the end of the tube. Um, as it turns out, it's a pretty rare condition. It's one in 5,000 women. If you do the math, there should be like 10,000 women worldwide that have that condition, right? Well, there's about a dozen case reports. Now, they ovulate every single month, right? And we heard yesterday that, oh, well, you know, Pregnancy decreases your risk. Birth control pill decreases your risk. Do these women ever get pregnant? Do they ever need to take a birth control pill? It's like, why don't they have it? And again, it's, hmm, good question. But they are missing their uterus, and what's going on with that? One of the things that we've talked about for, Samson came up with the theory of retrograde menstruation in like 1929 or something like that. I mean, it's almost 100 years. And said that that's associated with endometriosis. But if you stop and think about it, what is it that makes those cells attach where they don't belong, right? All right, so let's talk about the uterine secretome or sec secretome or whatever. Anyways, it's the stuff that's produced by the uterus every single cycle. What's the uterus trying to do in the women's bodies between when women start their cycles and when they stop their cycles? The goal of the body is to achieve pregnancy, right? And the ovaries involved in that and the uterus is involved in that. And the uterus basically has to be ready and one of the things that we think it does now, and there's, this is a hot topic of research now as well, as far as there's exosomes and things that are sitting there waiting inside the uterus and the fluid inside the uterus, waiting for that you know, blastocyst as a very early pregnancy, just waiting for that to come along to help direct it to what it's supposed to do. So our question was, does the uterine secretome, those factors from the endometrium, do they somehow enable implantation in the peritoneal cavity in the, where the cells don't belong? So there's a few existing models in mice looking at inclusion cysts you know, that again are from uh, the fallopian tube, we think. Um, but they do things to make that happen and they change genes. And the question is, well, do those changing genes have other effects? And so we were trying to think, 
is there a model just in a regular wild type mouse where you can get stuff to grow where it doesn't belong? Now, mice don't normally get endometriosis, and so that's a little bit of a complicating factor as well. And so, um, as far as we were aware, nobody had looked or considered the role of the uterine secretome as far as implantation of cells where they don't belong. Now, one of the things in basic science, people think about, okay, I'm gonna you know, look at stuff in the ovary, or I'm gonna look at stuff in the uterus. And they don't really think so much of, what's the effect of the uterus on the ovary as far as looking at cancers and those kinds of studies. Obviously, it's, you know, it makes your study way more complex as far as that, so. <clears throat> Needless to say, so in the Army, they actually had a little lab where I was at, and, and somebody else had worked on an endometriosis model um, and was successful at making it work. And so we thought, well, you know, this was right when that paper had come out about the endosophagiosis. Let's take a look at you know, and see if the fallopian tubes or if the oviducts in the mice, if they can implant as well. And so uh, we went in head and, and did that. And so our goal was to evaluate um, when could that, could, did that happen? And then if it did, you know, could we try to sort out, you know, some of these answers to the questions as far as the secretome. So our underlying hypothesis, endometrial tissue is stimulated by hormones, secretes factors that allow for implantation of endometriosis and that the implantation of endos endosalpingeal tissue requires the same factors. Again, nobody had considered uh, looking at oviducts and seeing if they could implant. And we thought that it would only happen in the presence of those factors was, was what our hypothesis was. And so here's a little schematic. We have a mouse called TD tomato. It's a fluorescent <coughs> mouse. And um, we also then took some, had a wild type mouse, and we would inject the tissue in different combinations uh, to see. And if you had implantation, you had these little you know, red lesions that were quite obvious to see because they fluoresce. And, and so in that sense, I mean, somebody else had come up with this, it wasn't my idea, but we just said, oh, well, hey, let's try this with the oviduct as well as doing it with the endometrium. And here's just, this basically says that we're doing it with and without. The one thing that we we're doing different is that when we gave the <coughs> tomato tissue, we would also you know, try to give endometrium you know, to provide the, the, the factors. And so up here on the left, you see live imaging. You can actually see this fluorescent tissue with a sp special camera. Uh, it's a little bit hard to say. There's a little kind of bright red spot in the upper left-hand corner I was trying to show on there, but uh, on the middle picture as far as, as tissue harvesting, but they're quite easy and obvious to see as far as numbers of lesions and being able to count them, and then you look at them um, under the microscope uh, then to uh, confirm that it is endosalpingeal cells. Well, initially, all the mice had lots of tissue, and we had done a bunch of stuff to try to make sure that they definitely got implantation, right? And so then once they got implantation, then we could say, okay, well, what can we do to affect and decrease that? And this is kind of the Cliff Notes version of, of what all we did. You know, so we looked at how much tissue, we had done a couple implantations at the beginning, we decreased it to one. You know, in mice, you know, mice have a whole bunch of pups, right? You know, you know, six or eight or 10, right? And so it's different from humans in that sense, but, um, and, and there's some other things that play a role that we manipulated. Looking at the hormones in, in the, both the donors um, and in the recipients, right? That you have your donor mouse that has hormones and you have the recipient mouse. And a mouse cycle is like four days, right? And we would harvest the tissue at 28 days. So that, you know, you, you gotta think about is that you know, donor recipient mouse having an effect on that tissue and its implantation. One of the other things that's uh, special about mice, there's some data that says, oh, you have to have estrogen. And so at the beginning, we gave everybody estrogen after the implantation. And it's like, well, do you really need that or not? And so we did a bunch of different stuff to try to figure out, does or do implantation factors that uterine secretum, do they play a role? One other model that we needed to think about and consider, there's a model looking at implantation and pregnancy where you can give pups progesterone on days two through 10. It knocks out a gene called FOXA2. So those mice will mate in a blastocyst will form and it will get to the uterus, but it does not implant, right? And so that mouse cannot carry a pregnancy. You can give something called leukemia inhibitory factor, which allows that implantation to occur. And that's been, it's got an unusual name, right? It's like, how does that associate with pregnancy? But it's been known for a decade or more that that helps implantation occur. And so you were, you're able to restore it 
with this implantation factor, right? And so then it's like, well, hey, you know what? You can buy that off the shelf. And so we decided we would potentially use some of that. So what we did then was, you know, we did experiments with, we, we gave our tomato mouse mice progesterone to knock this down to see if it would have an effect. We gave it back with wild type endometrium to provide the factors, and then we would also use leukemia inhibitory factor, and again, trying to see what all might play a role. Other things to consider is what about the type of recipient? You know, we used male recipients, we used female recipients, and the male recipients, we gave them stuff to block their hormone production, and in the females too, right? Because again, you want to see what role it all has. So finally then, this is kind of a summary of all the stuff that we did. Progesterone knockout mice have less in implantation of their endometrium. So it does appear to play a role in endometriosis. Um, if we gave the wild type endometrium and knockout endometrium together, it was no longer a significant effect. If we gave it with oviduct, the, the, the wild type endometrium, i.e. the presence of endometrial factors, um, or the secretome enhances the implantation of that. And again, here's another summary slide. On the left column, you, know, we, you give Degarolix, which essentially makes the mouse menopausal, there's hardly any implantation. One of the things is it says, well, there's a baseline implantation right, right? Uh, but then if you have normal hormones with no treatment, that means that they have their, their standard, you know, getting the mouse to the endometrial uh, secretory phase, that you got better implantation. And uh, with endometrium and leukemia inhibitory factor, there wasn't a difference, right? But the endometrium is producing its own factors. But there on the oviduct side, you see you know, hardly any implantation with the Degarelix. There's better implantation with a little bit of hormone and the best implantation when you give leukemia inhibitory factor. So tissue implantation improved with the secretome essentially in those implantation factors and with leukemia inhibitory factor is, is what we've found thus far. So quick comment on another model that people have looked at. There's a model uh, looking at oviductal cancer. It's called a, a P10 dicer, a double knockout. Um, and th that was developed at uh, Baylor, uh, in the Baylor labs and is somebody who's actually in Indiana now. Uh, but what he did is he took the ovaries out at four to five weeks, and that prevents the spread of oviductal carcinoma. And then they added back progesterone and, and found that, oh, it restores the metastasis, right? And so, the, oh, well, it has some effect on the ovary. But one of the questions is, well, what if the endometrium is just ready, and these, when you get the progesterone, that's what fires off the release of these factors. And I suspect that this data is actually supports what I'm thinking about, right? And that, that it's the, actually the, the, the role of the uterus in those in, in implantation factors. So anyways, this is very much in its infancy as far as the stuff that we're looking at. Um, what can we do with it? We did show that it does seem to work and play a role. Um, the question is, it's a whole new pathway that nobody's ever considered, right? And, and you know, certainly that data in that mouse model says, oh, well, you know, is this something that then plays a role for ovarian cancer metastasis? And can you somehow block it if you figure out what these different uh, factors are in this pathway that, 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 that people have not ever considered to play a role? So, there you go. I'm gonna stop there. Any questions? Well, we'll take questions at the end, but I knew I was gonna be short on time, so I was just trying to get through it all, but. Um.